Britain has a new prime minister, and Donald Trump approves. He's tough and he's smart. Uh, they're saying Britain Trump. They call him Britain Trump, and people are saying that that's a good thing. That they like me over there. In fact, only 28% of Britons have confidence in Trump, compared to 79% who had confidence in Obama. But the bigger issue is that Boris Johnson's rise to 10 Downing Street is bad for Britain, for Europe, and even for the United States. Johnson has assured the House of Commons that Britain will be out of the European Union in fewer than 100 days. How he can manage this sweeping withdrawal without sharp dislocations to the British economy remains a mystery. But it's clear that were Brexit to happen, it would accelerate the decline of Europe as a global actor on the world stage. Britain has always been an organizing force in Europe. It was the British government that took the lead making the Marshall Plan work in organizing the coalition that became NATO. Britain took a while to enter the European economic community, but once it joined in 1973, it became perhaps the most influential member. What is often forgotten in all the talk of the European Union's rules and regulations is that its central project for decades was the creation of a single market, harmonizing taxes, eliminating tariffs, eliminating barriers. That vision was articulated and urged most aggressively by Britain's free market prime minister, Margaret Thatcher. Washington's former ambassador to the EU, Stuart Eisenstadt, explains that Britain was always America's closest ally on substantive issues within Europe. He writes, with Brexit, the United States would lose a major supporter on a range of important trade and regulatory issues where the UK's more free market approach mirrored ours more closely than most EU member states. On US sanctions regimes against Iran, Russia, and other countries, on data privacy and antitrust matters, on counterterrorism and on national security issues. Britain is poised to withdraw from Europe at a time when Europe is withdrawing from the world. The continent was once led by figures like Thatcher, Mitterrand, Delors, and Cole, who all believed Europe had to play a pivotal role in global affairs. They built the single market, navigated the collapse of the Soviet empire, welcomed in the countries of Eastern and Central Europe, and projected Western values onto the post-Cold War world. Today, European leaders are consumed with Europe's economic strains, populist politics, and anti-European backlashes. Germany's Angela Merkel is in caretaker mode. France's Emmanuel Macron wants a stronger Europe, but is bedeviled by domestic troubles. And Britain, long the voice for energy and activism on the world stage, is busily preparing for an exit. The main challenge to global stability and order is obvious. It is the assertiveness of powers like Russia and China. In such a world, Europe, which has an economy second only to that of the United States, could play a crucial role in helping to preserve the rules, norms, and values that have been built up since 1945. But Europe would need to harness its power and act with purpose. In fact, it's moving in the opposite direction. We are watching the shriveling of a group of nations that have defined and dominated the international stage since the 17th century. And Brexit will only accelerate this sad slide. For more, go to cnn.com slash Fareed and read my Washington Post column this week. And let's get started. You are looking at Boris Johnson at Buckingham Palace on Wednesday with the Queen. When Elizabeth II asked Johnson to form a new government, he officially became the British Prime Minister, the 14th to serve under her as PM. Her first was Winston Churchill. More recently, Thatcher, Major, Blair, Brown, Cameron, and May. Let's bring in the panel. Zanny Minton Beddoes joins us from London, where she is the editor in chief of The Economist. Neil Ferguson is in Providence. He is an author and historian and a senior fellow at the Hoover Institute and a college uh, contemporary of Boris Johnson. Richard Haas is the president of the Council on Foreign Relations and a former director of policy planning at the State Department. Neil, let me start with you. Um, you're a historian, you're a great biographer. 
Um, and you also know Boris Johnson personally and have known him for decades. Paint a picture of the man for us. Well, you know, Marx famously said that history repeats itself first as tragedy, then as farce. He had Napoleon I and Napoleon III in mind. It's hard not to think of Boris as the farcical Churchill and this as a kind of Monty Python version of the movie Darkest Hour. I've known Boris for more than 30 years and it never ceases to amaze me uh, how he survives crises, fiascos and scandals, any one of which would destroy a normal person's career. And so I've come reluctantly to the conclusion that he must have something more than the farcical uh, qualities I just mentioned to have got to the very top, which was, after all, his sole reason for backing Brexit in the first place, despite all that has gone wrong in the course of his career, despite actually more recently his being quite a disastrous foreign secretary, suggests that he does indeed have that strange superpower that makes for political success. So while I share some of your scepticism, Fareed, about the difficulties that he faces, I, as one of his critics and not a close friend, at times I think even a friend of me, I have to admit he's, he's got something. Otherwise, he simply wouldn't have got to the top of the greasy pole. <laughs> Zani, how, do you, how does it look like uh, in Britain? What, 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 does it, what does the mood uh, look like there? Well, it's been quite a week. Um, we have a prime minister who is not just radically different in, in style uh, than his predecessor. I mean, you could not imagine a more different uh, prime minister to Theresa May than Boris Johnson. But we also have a wholly new team, a new policy and effectively a new government. And the striking thing about what's happened, you know, within hours of him becoming prime minister was the scale of the cull he did in the cabinet. More than half of Theresa May's cabinet was sacked. A whole new load of people brought in who basically shared two characteristics. One is that they were fiercely loyal to Boris Johnson, and that the second, they bought into the idea that we are leaving the European Union by October 31st, no ifs or buts. And that is now absolutely the policy of this government. And the other bit that I think is very, very clear is that this is a campaigning team. Not only did he bring Dominic Cummings, who was the mastermind be behind the Vote Leave campaign, into Downing Street as chief advisor, they clearly, I think, are a team that is getting girded up for, a very, for an election very soon. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if we don't have an election in October or before. Um, Richard Haas, when you look at it from the outside, uh, in order to get out by October 31st, it would seem like the Europeans would have to make some compromises. Now, first of all, it's, it's, it's basically August and nobody in Europe is working. So I don't quite see how in a hundred days in the middle of the summer, you were actually going to get some kind of uh, negotiated exit. You wouldn't get a negotiated exit in the middle of winter either. The Europeans are not going to cut a sweet deal with the British. There's no fondness for uh, the new prime minister or those around him. There's no chance the Europeans would set a precedent that might encourage others to follow suit. They, they want it to be, a, if it's going to be Brexit, it's going to be punitive uh, from, from their point of view. It will be bad for Europe. It'll be, I would argue, even worse for the United Kingdom. Indeed, I think it puts in jeopardy the fact uh, whether it, it remains united. But taking a step back, uh, looking at it from the American point of view, we lose a powerful uh, partner on the continent that can't really use its voice anymore with, with Europe. And to some extent, it puts, not in jeopardy, but it, it's part of a larger uh, pattern that we're seeing in international relations, where the post-World War II order is beginning to come apart. And Europe was an amazing success. You had the project of NATO and the project of, of Europe. And what we're seeing are both are coming under enormous pressure. It's, it's again, it's, it's further evidence that uh, we now have a disruptor in chief in the United States, and now he has a partner at uh, 10 Downing Street.